Good morning, church family. It's so great to be back with you. When vacations get too long, they become so tiring, so tiring. So I'm glad I'm back to work, and it's always an honor to be here with you, um, worshiping the Lord and serving Him. So it's great being back. Uh, I'm super excited today because we get to start a new sermon series that I really, really have been praying for a long time and thinking of, of, of a long time for. Um, I'm 43 years old now. No, not today, right? September. I mean, I, I keep going back and forth between 42 and 43, but my wife kindly reminds me I'm, 40, I'm 43. Yes, I am 43. So I'm owning it now. Uh, I went on a trip this um, a couple of days ago with some friends, and uh, for the first time in my life, I was the oldest one in a, gr- in a group of guys. <laughs> and it feels a little funny, right? But you know what? That gives me the right to be the oldest one. And now finally I'm getting to the stage when I get to say whatever I want, do whatever I want. Not quite there yet. I have little ones, but, and, I've, uh, and I have to, to keep in life with my wife as well. But, uh, but I'm getting there, right? But, but, but what, what's been dawning on me, the older I get is this. I have more miles in the back, a lot more experience, but a lot more things that God has entrusted me. So I realized that what he's given me is not just for me. It's for those who are coming. It's for those who are coming. And you know, when the Lord called us to serve here at the FBC, we were excited, but we knew there would be a lot of challenges ahead. And there is no doubt in my mind, God has called us to be a disciple maker, multiplying church. But to be a disciple maker, multiplying church we are going to be moved out of our comfort zone. We're going to have to change our mindset from one of getting to one of giving. Because everything that God has given us in Christ is for us to keep, for us to live, for us to enjoy. But so much more than that. It is so that we can share it freely we received. Now we're invited to freely give. God wants an army of life givers. And to get this job done, he sent the prophets, he sent the Bible, but he sent his living word, his son, Jesus Christ. When God's final word came, it was not just about the prophets. It was not just about the scriptures. As great as the Bible is, as great as the prophets were, God was saving the best for his living word, Jesus Christ. So this journey that we've been talking about of discipleship, this new sermon series is called Follow Me. And I want you to get your Bible sneakers. Yes. This series is all about bringing the written word of God, the Bible, to become the living word of God. Jesus Christ living, breathing through his body. He calls the church his bride. The church is the family of people who belong to God. We were dead, but now we are alive. And we've been called to live, to breathe the very life of God, the the breath of God, the spirit of God, filling our lungs, filling our lives and living and energizing us with the power of resurrection every single day of our lives. So wherever your foot lands, Christ is landing. Wherever your foot lands, the kingdom of God has arrived. It's been 29 years since I started that journey. I was struggling for about a year reading my Bible. I was not a believer. I was not a follower of Jesus Christ. I knew about God, but I hadn't personally surrendered my life to him. And for about a year, I read my my Bible, the Old Testament, and boy, did God hit me on the head. There was no doubt after reading the Old Testament that I was a sinner. I just didn't know how to make it work. You, You get me, right? I tried religion, I tried good works, I tried a lot of things. I knew I looked really good on the outside, but in the inside, and when people didn't know on my secret parts of life, it wasn't quite what it should be. But after a year of wrestling, my friend invited me to church on a Sunday. So we went out for lunch after, and I told my friend, you got to tell me if there is a solution for this mess. I was about to finish the Old Testament. I was reading Malachi, and God was just hitting the people of Israel so hard. And I just told him, you got to tell me, is there a solution for this mess? And my friend told me, one of these days, we're going to talk about it. And I said, one of these days? No, today we're going to talk about it. I need to know today. So he saw that I was pretty serious and said, okay. So we finished lunch. We went to my room, and he just opened the Bible and read from John chapter 1, 
Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And you know what? When I heard the word of God, everything made sense. I had read about the sacrifices in the Old Testament. I just didn't have an altar to bring a goat, right? So I, was read about, I had read about all of that. And then from popular religion, I knew about Jesus. I knew he died for us. But I'll tell you what I didn't know at least not in my heart. Intellectually, I've heard it. I, I knew it intellectually. It, it had never landed on my heart. I didn't know this. Jesus died for us, but he died for me, a sinner. I was a sinner, no doubt about that, and I needed a savior, and that savior was Jesus Christ. So today, as we start our series, Follow Me, it's going to be based on the, on the Gospels. The goal is learning what Jesus did with his disciples to turn us into a disciple maker, multiplying church. Church, this is the time for DFPC to be a church that is so much more, so much more than just being about ourselves. This is the time when we see the world and we hear his call and we say, here I am, send me. I want to join you, Lord Jesus, in wherever you are, whatever you're doing. I want to be part of your life. I want to live for you. I will follow but to do that, we got to know where we're going. We got to know what's happening to us. And Jesus takes three years of his life investing in a bunch of guys and a group of disciples around to show them what this process would be like. So today, we're going to talk about the first step. And here's the, here's the question we're going to talk about today. Where does the discipleship journey of a Christ follower begin? This is very important. Some of you will say, well, this is so basic. I already know that. I've heard the gospel many times. You will hear the gospel for all of eternity. And you will not be able to exhaust the power of God for salvation. The gospel is always good news. The gospel is always the royal proclamation that the kingdom of God is real. That death doesn't hold a thing against us anymore because Jesus paid with his perfect righteousness for us. The gospel proclaims that God is renewing all things. The gospel proclaims that Jesus is king. The gospel is the very center of everything in God's revelation in our life for all eternity. So don't get tired of it. Come back to the basics, because when you dig deeper in the basics, you, you will realize that God's love is ever deeper, ever wider, and you will never, ever, ever be able to exhaust all that's in there. But here's the thing also. Here in our fellowship, we have people that may have been coming to church for a long time. Maybe here already sing the songs, hear the baptisms and everything, but we're in the crowd, and we have never trusted Jesus Christ. This first step is so important that unless you answer Jesus' invitation, you're not going to make it forever into his presence. You're not going to arrive to where he's leading. You may be in a crowd, but crowds are not good enough because Jesus is going to stare at you. He's going to look at you in the eye and tell you, are you, are you willing to follow me? Me, not the crowd, me. Jesus wants a personal relationship with you. And unless you answer his invitation personally, you can be in the crowd, but you may not be really who he wants you to be. So we're going to take a look at where we started this journey. It was 29 years for me. 29 years ago, I was 14. Do you know when you started your journey? Have you started it? We're going to talk about that today. If you have your Bible, I'm going to invite you to open it in Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1, we're going to be in different Gospels through this series. So if you haven't read your Gospels, I would encourage you to look at that. I'll give you later on a tool that is going to be very, very helpful next week for you to, to navigate this series. But today we're going to be in Mark chapter 1, the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, according to Mark. Now, by the way, you have four Gospels because everyone is a slightly different angle of relationship of what Jesus came to do and he, how he is the king. In the Gospel of Mark, Jesus is presented as a man of action that comes to fulfill God's work, word, uh, word, but also he is the servant of God who is coming to do everything that God promised, every, fulfill every promise of God. So in the gospel of Mark, Jesus uh, comes in, in, in fulfillment to God's word. It says right there, verse 1, Mark chapter 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before you who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, may make his paths straight. 
God's been preparing for a long time. He's been working in your life for a long time. He's been making ways to have a personal encounter with you and with me, with humanity. He sent his word. He sent the prophets. It's up to us if we listen or not. But you know what? Right now in our Bible reading plan, in our Bible journal, we're reading through Hosea, right? Even though we are indifferent to God, even though we're rude to God many times, even though we want what God gives us without wanting God, God's love is relentless. So God made a huge avenue for him to show up. God is not going to take a no for an answer. I don't want to read my Bible today. That's okay. God is going to make sure that you're going to have a face-to-face with God. And to the, for that purpose, he sent his son, Jesus Christ. In the following verses right here in chapter 1, Mark, you have a description of how John comes proclaiming, there is one that is coming, one that's stronger, more powerful than me. He will baptize you in the Holy Spirit. And then right there in verse, verse 9, you have Jesus' baptism, then his temptation, then the beginning of his ministry in verse 14. So Jesus comes, and I want you to hear some of the first words that Jesus shares with the crowd, he says. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is what? Fulfilled. And the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Jesus Christ came to this world to bring you an invitation. An invitation to what? To the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is the realm in which God rules, in which his will is done. And the kingdom of God is coming to a rebellious world, this earth that is caught in sin and rebellion and death. And the kingdom of God is coming to bring life. It's coming to bring God. That's why it is the kingdom of God, because God is present there. And now he's present in the person of Jesus Christ. And he's saying two things. He's saying, repent And believe this good news, the good news that this is the time, this is the chance you have to experience what God made you for. Nowadays, we have all sorts of influences in our life, right? And if you go online, if you're a social media savvy person, you've heard this word over and over again, influencers. Everybody wants to be an influencer, right? Everybody wants to have crowds of people right there in their accounts, millions of followers. You have influences on influencers on fashion, on the way to eat, on workout, and everybody's trying to get a crowd. Because influence is all about having an effect on somebody else's life. Everybody wants to be an influencer. You know what? This is all about, really? This is all about answering the following question Who do you follow? We all need direction in our life. And ahead of you, whatever you do with your life will be at the mercy of whoever or whatever it is that you follow. You can follow your own desires. You can follow somebody else's recommendation. Who do you follow? Where is it leading? All those kind of questions begin with that first step. Every journey, no matter how long it is, starts with a step or two. Who will you follow? So today, from Jesus' words, we're going to see that followers of Christ begin their discipleship journey when they do two things. The first one is this. They answer Christ's call to a lifelong, life-changing, and life-giving future. That's in our mission statement, right? But that's in our mission statement, not because we're so cute and so original. It's because this is precisely the process that Jesus told his disciples they would have to commit to, to be able to follow him. Look at what Jesus started saying right there. Like we just read a minute ago in Mark 1.14. He told them, the kingdom of God, this is the time, this is the time of fulfillment. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Now, let me unpack these two words quickly before I make my point. Jesus' invitation is an invitation to two things. He says, repent. And then believe the gospel. What is repentance? Repentance is realizing that we're going in the wrong direction, the direction of sin, the direction of destruction, the direction of our flesh and this fallen world. But then God intercepts our pathway and he says, you don't have to go in that direction anymore. Repentance is turning around 180 degree mind change where we agree with God and now we tell him, I want to go in your direction. But I love the word repentance. I love the word repentance. Let me tell you why. Because repentance is a hopeful word. 
It's a word that tells you that no matter how horrible your life is, how tough your circumstances are, God is able to change them. God is able to turn your life around from the pits of hell, literally, into the kingdom of God. The Bible tells us that God gave us his son to rescue us from the power of darkness and bring us into the kingdom of light. Repentance is that switch that turns you now in the direction of Jesus where you open your heart and for the first time you say, Lord, I mess up. I cannot lead myself. I need you. We've become so powerful, haven't we? With technology and all the stuff we have. We have things like GPS. I drove several thousand miles on vacation a little while ago to Florida and we have this little thing that tells you in a hundred feet, feet, turn right. We can arrive anywhere. Yeah? What happens if you're driving through a place that there is no reception? Ah, panic grips you, right? Let me tell you this. There is not a place in the universe where God has no reception. God is ever, ever able to lead us. And the proof of that is Jesus Christ. He came to this lost world without God's signal, right? No reception. And he said, you know what? We're going to get as loud and as clear as we can get. So he said, repent. There's a, a chance to change. And now, this is the second part. He says, believe the gospel. He came to bring an invitation of good news. And the only thing that he's asking from me and you is not that we, that we change out of our self-effort or positive thinking. It's not for you to try harder. It's for you to simply trust him. Believing means that you know what he says is true that you give your assent, that you agree is true, but that you entrust yourself. The, the reformers describe faith in three steps. Said there is, there is a noticia, there is intellectual knowledge, there is a census, a, a yielding of the heart and will, but there is an entrusting of our whole self, fiducia, knowing that he wants what is best for us. I yield to you, Lord. I fully surrender. So what Jesus is saying right here at the beginning of the journey is this, you cannot lead your life alone. You cannot walk this life without me. Trust me. Hold my hand. I will be your guide. I'm going to take you. And then what did he do? Let me tell you what's going to happen if you trust me. Right there, Jesus is walking around and he finds the first people he's going to invite on this journey. Right there on verse something, verse 16. <laughs> I still haven't found my glasses. I'm sorry. I'm working on it. Verse 16 says, Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting the net in the sea, for they were fishermen. Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you, I will make, I will make you become fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat, mending the nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hard servants and followed him. This is such a beautiful passage because, you know, Jesus doesn't send you a like me pose. He doesn't tweet you. He comes and finds you in a very personal, on your way kind of face, right there where you are so busy with your nets. When you're making your living in your career, in your pathway, he shows up in the most unlikely ways, stares at you in the eye and gives you an invitation. But his invitation is a command, not a suggestion. He says, follow me. What does that mean? Trust me enough to set the direction of your life. Follow me is an invitation to a lifelong journey. Starting now, you will follow me. Not the internet, not the Facebook, not the Twitter, not all these influencers. You will follow me. My voice will be the voice that will lead you through life. Follow me. And then there's a promise. He says, I will make you. You notice that he didn't say, and then you will make yourself. The more knowledge you have, the more will you put into it, the, more, the better you become. No, no, no. Jesus says, when you trust me, when you follow me, I have what it takes to make you what you need to be. I will make you. What will, you make? What will, what will he make out of us? He says, fishers of men. Imagine the picture right there, right? You have the fishermen right there. God is so gracious that he puts himself at our level and relates in ways that we get it. He says, whatever you're busy with, whatever is so important for you, your business right now, I will give you something that's much better. Something that not only will give you significance in your own life, but will be able to bless other people. It's going to be a journey that is lifelong, life-changing, 
and life-giving. Now, think about that for a second. When you go and fish for fish, what do you want the fish for? <sighs> well, in the United States, you do have catch and release, right? It's just for fun. Most places in the world where you fish for fish is so that you can eat them. And you eat them so you can stay alive. Jesus is the first one that will turn the tables around in the upside kingdom where you catch fish, not to kill them, but to give them life. So you're going you're gonna to be catching, man. You're going to be people of influence on in other people's lives so that as I give you life, other people will find life through me. You're going to become a life giver. We all are born as life takers. All of us. Look at a little baby, right? A baby takes and takes and takes and takes and takes. Thankfully, when they go to college, they start giving back. <laughs> and take. But Jesus has the power to make us so that as we become more and more like him, we turn this selfish heart of stone into a life-giving, God-like heart, just like him. So this is where he wants to take you and me. Life-giving future. Now, how does he do that? We're going to unpack this as we go more, but let me read one more, one more verse for you. That is the wrong verse. Come with me to Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3, verse 13 to 20. Some days pass, Jesus still showing what he can do. He heals people. He teaches uh, the word of God. But then after a little while, when the disciples are doing the 30-day money return trial, right? Should we follow Jesus or not? We've been following him, but we're not sure. Jesus finally takes it a notch up and he recruits the 12 disciples, the apostles. And right there in verse 13, I want you to hear after praying for a significant time, a whole night, Jesus comes back. And in verse 7, 3, 7 says, Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the sea. A great crowd followed. Excuse me, verse 13. He went up on the mountain and called to him those whom he desired, and they came to him. And he appointed 12, whom he also named apostles, so they might be with him, that he might send them out to preach, to have authority to cast out demons. He appointed the 12, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, the son of Zebedee, the jo and John, the brother of James, to whom he gave the name Boanerges, which, which is sons of thunders, Andrew and Philip and Bartholomew and Matthew and Thomas and James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus and Simon, the zealot and Judas is scared who betrayed him so jesus invited people follow me i will make you fishers of men he invited those ones specifically they left everything they follow jesus jesus goes healing teaching the word of god and you may be wondering jesus how long am i going to follow you lifelong am i how am i going to do that i'm going to change your life it's going to be life changing and what for well so you become life givers so how do we do that notice the priorities of jesus he came back and he established them. He says first, verse 14, he appointed 12 whom he also named apostles, the sent ones. I want you to see where the direction is moving you. He is going to make you a sent one, just as the apostles were. How? Look at what he says. First, he established them that they might be with him. Your first priority as a follower of Jesus Christ is not to do things for God is to be the real deal. And to be the real deal, to be a follower of Jesus Christ, you got to be with him. The Bible has a family word for that. It's called communion. When Jesus invites you to follow him, you know what he really wants for all eternity? That's why it's lifelong. He wants you to be with him. Because to be with God is what we were made for. When we talk about reading our Bible, about praying, <sighs> Even if it is looking through a glass darkly, God in his mercy meets us in our fellowship with him in communion to be with him. And then look at what he says next. To be with him, that he might send them out to preach. When you're with him, he's going to give you a message to share and he's going to send you to bring it where people need it most. Not only that, as he's working in your life, Look at what he says, and have authority to cast out demons. So here's the process. Right in your sermon notes, I want you to know your journey starts with fellowship with God. If you haven't trusted Jesus Christ, repenting from your sins and believing 
He's the one who came to save you. He's the one who died for you. He's the one who was buried, rose from the grave. As we hear in the baptisms, if you haven't done that, you got to do that. Now, let me read you one last thing and let me close with this. In verse 7, it was not just the disciples that were hearing God's word. There was a crowd. Jesus had been doing miracles and all sorts of things. Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the sea, and a great crowd followed him from Galilee and Judea, Jerusalem, Edomia, from beyond the Jordan, from around Tyre and Sidon. When the great crowd heard all that he was doing, they came to him, and he told his disciples to have a boat ready for him because the crowd... For because of the crowd, lest they crush him. For he had healed many, so that all who had diseases pressed around him to touch him. I want you to hear this because it's super important. Great crowds are willing to follow Jesus because of what he can do and what we can get out of him. But it is so easy to get lost in the crowd. You hear us talk here at the FPC. We are big enough for kingdom impact, but we are small enough to be family. Somebody has to know you enough to ask you, have you trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Somebody has to know you enough to pray for you, to make sure that you're being a follower, not just a crowder. And to be a follower... You're going to have to be called out of the crowd. That's what Jesus did. After praying for them all night long, he came on their face and said, are you willing to identify with me? By the way, that's what baptism means, right? How do we make disciple makers? First, we have to make disciples. And to be a disciple, we have to go to all the nations and baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So here's the catch. Jesus invites you to follow him, and he will make you a fisherman. But first, you have to step out of the crowd to devote yourself to his redemptive purposes. And those redemptive purposes are three very simple ones. Communion, worship, life change, discipleship, and then life multiplication, commission. I don't know where you are in your journey, but today, if you haven't taken the first step, I want to invite you. You heard what Jesus can do in the life of children, teenagers, adults. He's changed our lives. And I'm telling you, I followed him for 29 years. And every year, I'm more grateful that I did. Because every year, every year, I can see clearer why we call him Lord and Savior. He will not disappoint you. I will. Everybody here will. But he will never, never, never Never leave you, nor forsake you. If you trust him, that's the first step. You need a good lead. and There's no better than Jesus Christ. So let me close with this. If you want to join his journey, it's not enough to hear the talk. The crowds heard a lot of sermons, right? It's not enough to hear the talk. You must walk the walk. Answer his call today. Step out of the crowd and follow him. In a moment, we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper. I don't know where you are spiritually. Maybe you've already taken that step saying, I've trusted Jesus a long time ago, so am I good? Well, you are in so many more ways that you can imagine. But God doesn't want you to wait until you die to go to heaven, right? Heaven has already come down. The kingdom of God is at hand. He wants you to, he wants you to be a picture of heaven on this broken earth. If you just let him. If you just let him, maybe right now is a good time to renew that commitment you made when you took that first step. And you say, Lord Jesus, you know what? I feel this love growing a little bit of cold because of the context in which I live. But today, I want you to blaze in my heart like that first time when you loved me. That first love. I want to love you, Lord Jesus. I want to follow you.